Hello, everyone, and welcome to another OD Wire webinar. It's Adam Farkas along with... Good evening, everyone. We're with Paul Farkas here. <laughs> and tonight, Paul, it's all about dry eye, one of your favorite topics oh, yeah. through the years. Um, we're very fortunate tonight to have Dr. David Kading with us uh, from Seattle. Um, and Dr. Kading is actually a, a, a specialist, and he uh, is, I believe, the only only optometrist in the state of Washington to earn fellowship status in the Contact Lens Society of America. So, uh -huh. uh, and he has a great interest in dry eye, and he's here tonight to talk to us all about the tear science system and meibomian gland dysfunction. Speaking of that, however, because of full disclosure, I've got to admit uh, that I have known Dr. Donald Korb uh, from before you were born, Adam. So it's been Oof. a lot of years. <laughs> And from the earliest times with, with Dr. Korb, uh, his, his concern has been mybobium gland dysfunction. And I think that we're reaching a, a pinnacle of his career. Uh, we're discussing this tonight because finally there are some answers. Uh, and also part two of the full disclosure is my former practice in New York was one of the first in the New York metropolitan area to have the lipoflow lip, lipo system a tongue twister, <laughs> lipid flow system uh, in the practice. And uh, knowing that uh, we were going to have tear science on tonight, I made the effort of reaching the practice. And I asked them, what do you think of the system? And I got back a very curt remark, but it had three little words that said, it's a winner. And if they say it's a winner, that means that not only is it a winner for the patient, but it's a winner for the practice as well. So I think uh, whoever is listening tonight can take that to the bank, that the people that are using it really like it, and so, so do the patients. And with that said, Ad, you take it over. Okay, well, I guess um, what we're going to show you right now, actually, you'll notice that the audio quality is a little bit different. Dr. Kading actually uh, gave this lecture a couple of days ago, and what we did was we recorded it then, and we saw that he did a really tight job. It was a nice 30-minute, concise and a really good job. And we thought instead of going through it again tonight where anything goes, what we do is we just give you this really quick 30 minute talk and then get that out of the way so then we can all have questions and really have a good discussion uh, about the device and any questions that you might have because I think that's gonna be even the most illuminating part is talking to folks who really use the system. Yeah, and for our new listeners, uh, tell them how to, to ask the questions. Right, so to ask questions as the presentation's going on, you'll see the Q&A box on the right side of the screen. Um, and one question already is, I have no picture. That's because nothing started yet. <laughs> so don't worry. Um, but feel free, if you're having any kinds of problems during the talk, to just put it right into that Q&A box. And we'll hold the questions aside until the very end. The only folks who can actually see the, the questions that you're asking are us uh, and Dr. Kading. So we can take your question, and then when the presentation's done, go over it. Um, and I think this is going to be a really fun interactive session. Yeah, but write down the questions as, as it occurs to you during the presentation. Uh, rather than try to do it at the end and forget it. Right, we'll hold it aside. So with that said, why don't I crank this thing up and let's get underway. All right, thank you for the introduction. My name is uh, Dr. Dave Kading, and I'm an optometrist, and I practice in Seattle, Washington. And uh, I'm excited about the webinar tonight. Uh, the topic is Discovering Your Practice's Untapped Dry Eye Care Potential. And uh, really, uh, really looking forward to uh, sharing with you some of the information that we've learned over the last uh, six months or so uh, about dry eye and, uh, and way, the way we've kind of changed our dry eye protocols within our practice, which really has had some great patient outcomes. And uh, as, as I had, uh, had said here, um, I practice in Seattle. My practice is called Specialty Eye Care Group. And uh, the format of tonight's presentation is to uh, do a little bit of an overview of MGD uh, and uh, talk about some of the opportunities of how we can provide uh, better care to our patients. Uh, also, we're going to talk about uh, Lippy View and Lippy Flow. And uh, then what I'd really like to do is open it up to some questions and uh, just hear what some of the thought processes are of, of you and your current practice with, with dry eye and uh, see if uh, through our experience we'd be able to uh, help you out in some way. 
So let's break it off first of all with an MGD overview. You know, in the last couple of years, we've really come into some great insight and knowledge about meibomian gland dysfunction and uh, what it really means for our patients and our practices. You know, dating back to, uh, you know, when we were in optometry school, many of us uh, 5, 10, 15 years ago, meibomian gland uh, disease and dysfunction was, was really hardly discussed because there wasn't a whole lot that we could do and a whole lot that we really knew to do for these patients. Uh, what we're realizing more and more, particularly, uh, you know, what with the International Workshop on Meibomian Gland Dysfunction uh, had to say in 2011, was that meibomian gland dysfunction may well be the leading cause of dry eye disease throughout the world. And really that kind of opened our eyes that uh, we had been looking at maybe the wrong thing when we were diagnosing patients with dry eye. Uh, in fact, LEMP, in a study uh, that was done in two th published in 2012, uh, revealed that uh, you know, around 86% of our patients have meibomian gland dysfunction as a, as a cause for their dry eye. You can see here of the 159 patients in this study, only 23 of them were aqueous deficient alone, making up 14%, whereas the vast majority had meibomian gland dysfunction as the primary cause, and a large percentage of patients had meibomian gland dysfunction and aqueous deficiency, making up a total of 86%. Of, uh, of the patients in their study. And since we have really started looking at dry eye in a new way, we've really started to identify that what we thought was the cause of dry eye before, and particularly before we started looking at the meibomian glands, uh, was not really the accurate way of, of diagnosing and treating dry eye. Um, the main real issue here is that meibomian gland dysfunction is, is chronic and is progressive. And the concern here is that if it's untreated, it can lead to atrophy and ultimately uh, drop out of the glands where uh, the glands are just entirely gone. And I, I have, have started in the last six months or so to start talking about meibomian glands in the same way that we think about the optic nerve in glaucoma. And that is that once the tissue in glaucoma is gone, there's no getting it back. And there's no real way that we're going to, uh, you know, be able to help those patients once the loss has occurred. Well, we know that, uh, that dry eye is a major part of most of our offices. And uh, if not helped, these patients will go on to lose their meibomian glands. This is a mybography right here, and we've brought this into our practice recently, and really it's been, no pun intended here, but it's been eye-opening as to um, what's really occurring with the structures of the eyelid that create the lipid layer of the tears. As you can see on the right-hand side of this screen, these channels that are white, those are the meibomian glands. And this patient is relatively healthy with their glands. They maybe have about 15% uh, total loss of their meibomian glands, but you can see they're long and uh, very articulated and very high quality. Whereas the patient on the left-hand side, if you look at the lower lid as it's turned, over on the temporal side, there's just a few glands that are still remaining. And as you go more nasal, those glands are really dropping out. On the upper lid, you can see that there's a couple glands still remaining in the center part. But as you go more towards the posterior, further back in the lid, you can see remnants of where the glands were in existence, uh, but have now begun to die out. The real big concern here is that these truncated glands have, have atrophied and died, and they will never come back. This patient is at a uh, 80 to 90 percent loss of the meibomian glands, which means that the total gland quality that still has the potential to produce oil is only at 10 percent. And so, even if treated in the best way, this patient will still uh, potentially have some dry eye issues. So, 
we really need to be catching these patients earlier on and looking for ways that we can help them out. Uh, dry eye is affecting millions and millions of Americans, and the statistics in the study is that you know around 25 million Americans suffer from dry eye. Um, I, I'm not particularly a fan of this particular uh, uh, this particular statistic because I believe that it's much higher than that. In my practice, if you really ask the patients you know, do you ever experience irritation or dryness with your eyes, the percentage of patients that report that they do is very, very high. Now, they might not do anything about it, and they may not need treatment yet, but those patients may need to be classified in a similar fashion to the way that we fashion and, and classify our patients as glaucoma suspects. These people are dry eye suspects that need to be monitored, because if their glands do get plugged and do start to die, we need to initiate treatment to save these patients from having that, with the analogy, nerve loss like we do in glaucoma, the meibomian gland loss like we do in, in this meibomian gland dysfunction. Uh, significant dollars are spent annually on dry eye relief, 3.8 billion. This is a major area for industry to really be looking to save these patients. Uh, and we know from other studies that a patient who has moderate dry eye may spend in the neighborhood of $2,500 to $3,000 a year trying to find dry eye relief. And that's every year. And so it's a, it's a significant dollar. And if you break that down to the individual patient, that you know, two to $3,000 is pretty high. It is a disease that is most frequently encountered uh, by our patients. We see more dry, dry eye disease and meibomian gland disease in our practices than most other, uh, you know, than most other uh, diseases that we encounter. And it does frequently present um, with obvious signs, but maybe more commonly, and we're not looking for it, it presents with what we call non-obvious, and a, a, a situation where the glands are a non-obvious MGD is when you look at the glands, you look at the eye, and it doesn't look red, it doesn't look dry, it doesn't look irritated, but when you go ahead and either use your finger or, uh, as I'll describe later, something called an MGE uh, to express those glands, you don't get any oil out of them. Uh, this, again, is the type of patient that, whether they're symptomatic or not, needs to be monitored and potentially even treated so that those glands don't die away. Ultimately, if this is creating a major opportunity, uh, mostly to give our patients a better outcome. Um, that's going to build referrals and retention within our practice, and we can have some significant practice growth as a result of looking at these dry eye patients in a new way. Uh, you know, one of the, the best technologies that has come along is, is relatively new to the industry. We've only just had this technology for the last three years with the Lippy Flow, which you see on the left, and the Lippy View on the right. The uh, small little instrument in the center has become a uh, an everyday instrument that I use in my everyday eye exams, and that's what's called an MGE, and we'll talk about how we use that here in a moment. Let's first break it down to evaluating the actual tears that are on our patient's eyes. The lippy view is an interferometer that measures the overall lipid layer thickness of our patient's eyes. And uh, let me just say, this machine is, is really cool because it shows off to the patients that you're technologically in advance. And it shows some really valuable information that particularly your dry eye patients won't get anywhere else. It's got a relatively small footprint, so it's easy to fit around the office. It's got a touch screen. And, uh, you know, the patient isn't foreign to the concept of putting their chin in the chin rest in. Uh, looking straight ahead. They don't have to keep their eyes open for long periods of time or anything like that. They blink normally when they're doing the test. 
the test takes around uh, 20 seconds. Actually, it's about 19 seconds um, that the test takes. And then what you see here is the report that is generated. And uh, what we really want to do with this report is help to educate our patients, um, identify whether the overall quality or thickness of the lipid layer is, is thin or thick. Um, I know it is somewhat small, but on the printout, what you can see near the bottom here is that there are uh, two printouts for the right and the left eye. The printout on the right-hand side, this patient has um, an average uh, lipid layer thickness of about 85. And uh, this particular patient is, uh, is doing better on that eye, on their left eye, than on their right eye. One of the other things that is critical to look at is to identify whether the patient is blinking appropriately or is not blinking appropriately. And we use this to establish a baseline, and then we establish this particular machine to assess how well treatment has gone with whatever the treatment is that we're using. And as you can see that are circled here, the partial blinks on this particular patient are not too bad, one out of, out of three and zero out of three for this particular patient. The other aspect that we like to look at is not only what is the overall amount of thickness of lipid on the surface of the eye, but what are the glands actually doing for us? And that's where we use this instrument called the meibomian gland evaluator or the MGE. This uh, little instrument was, uh, was produced uh, by Don Korb. And what it does is it presents a very, very gentle pressure onto the surface of the eye. And, uh, you know, I've been pushing on glands for the last 10 years. I kind of consider it our right as optometrists to be able to poke our patients in the eye. And uh, here we've actually got something that is standardized. When we're pushing, pushing and pu uh, putting pressure on the eyelid, we're probably exerting pounds uh, of pressure upon the eyelid to try to get those oils to flow. And if the oil flows or doesn't flow, what does that tell you about the eyelid? It, does, it doesn't have any consistency um, to really give you an accurate number or uh, identify anything about those oils. What the MGD does, uh, MGE does is it presents uh, about one gram of pressure per square millimeter. And the reason that that is important is that is nearly equivalent to the amount of pressure that the eyelid presents upon itself as it is blinking. And what, it, what we can then see is we can evaluate the amount of secretion that is coming from the gland orifice when we express the gland from this. The way we do this is we start off temporally and we we look at about five glands. We express and push in with the MGE, and we count the number of glands that are expressing. We then look at the quality of the oil that is coming out, and from those two numbers, we can calculate an overall uh, oil and gland score for the patient um, for the total eyelid. That gives us a good number to be able to use as a baseline to know whether this patient's oils are flowing or whether they're not flowing. And then with the treatments that we have, we look for those numbers to improve over time. The, uh, the big concept that we're looking at is if these patients who are working on their computers for 6, 8, 12, 14 hours a day, and then they go home, and what do they do? They get back on their computer, they get back on their cell phone, their iPad, and whatnot. When we're looking, looking at a computer device or an electronic device, we, we just basically fail to blink as often. And when we do blink on those instruments, oftentimes there are partial blinks. Corb has identified and has worked with other scientists to kind of reveal that when a gland is not expressed through the normal blink, those glands will become plugged. And we've shown and talked about already that when a gland becomes plugged, it ends up dying. So out of all of that information, we've come to realize that there needs to be a way that we can get those glands opened up. 
And for years, dating back, you know, our, all, way, all the way back to when my grandfather was an optometrist, the treatment was to attempt to get our patients to get heat on their eyes for a significant period of time. Well, fact of the matter is our patients just aren't compliant with that. If you have patients who are compliant with hot compresses on a continual basis, good on you. It's just a difficult thing to get them continually doing that. And what we realize is their compliance will drop off significantly after a week or maybe two weeks after they come into the eye exam. The other problem is unless those patients exert a significant amount of pressure on their eye, which could have some long-term damage to the corneal tissue, which has been heated up, those patients could have some issues. So out of all of those concerns, out of the fact that our patients are not compliant, uh, the Lippy Flow thermal pulsating system was created. And what this does is it presents a safe and effective treatment to help uh, the upper and lower eyelids to uh, express those plugged meibomian glands, and it only takes about 12 minutes in the office. And it's a very simple, comfortable, painless procedure that our patients go through. The disposable activator looks like what you see right here. And uh, the, what's closest to us in the picture is what looks like a large uh, scleral contact lens. And the uh, part that goes right against the cornea in the globe uh, basically is just a shell. The, uh, the front part of that that goes against the eyelid heats up to around 40 to 45 degrees Celsius, which, you know, is just over 100 degrees, uh, 105 degrees, which is a very comfortable uh, temperature. The, the patients that have the procedure are very comfortable. They don't uh, feel any discomfort for the most part at all. And then there is also a, uh, a composition of uh, air bladders that um, inflate over the and, and deflate it to express the oil out after the, the glands have been heated up. And what we're basically doing is we're taking all of the glands that are plugged, either because of the decreased quality or because the surface uh, glands get plugged, um, and we're heating up that oil and then we're expressing it out. So now the patient is completed with the uh, procedure and uh, their glands are completely open. In fact, during the procedure, the patients uh, end up with a very rich oil uh, on the surface of their eye after the procedure. And, you know, it does take just a little bit of time to have the meibomian glands recreate the oil, but now the glands are open so that the patient can be uh, more comfortable uh, ongoing. And when I say more comfortable, 90% of patients uh, had a total meibomian gland score improvement. And what that gland score improvement is with using the MGE when the glands are expressed, the quality and the number of glands go up significantly. And we've seen this in our office as well. We just did an overall assessment of the first group of patients that, that we had done that had come back for the follow-up after several months and showed a significant improvement in the gland score. And also, not only is the gland score from an objective standpoint improving, uh, nearly 80% of patients reported an improvement in their overall dry eye symptoms. Now, we don't just ask the patients, do you feel better, but we go much further and much deeper into it and, uh, and ask them how they feel. What's the grittiness? What's the dryness? And what's the level of irritation that they have? And uh, nearly 80% of the patients reported an improvement in their overall dry eye symptoms. I challenge you to think of any other treatment that is out there that gives the subjective and objective improvements of the 90 and 80% uh, improvement overall, which is why this is a, a treatment that has really revolutionized things for our practice. And what it's done is it's, uh, it's really given us some empowerment and leadership in the overall uh, communication that we have with our patients um, and, and overall in the community as well. Uh, in fact, just last evening, uh, we had 
a group of doctors into the office so that we could share with them on the treatments of dry eye, uh, could share with them how we are looking at dry eye in a new way. And I will say, for credibility's sake, we, we don't do lippy flow on every single patient. It is a tool that we use for our dry eye patients, but it is a tool that we were uh, significant, significantly missing out on, excuse me, significantly missing out on prior to purchasing it. And really, it's brought out a whole new level of help and treatment for our patients. Um, it's also given us, uh, you know, there, there's been some dedicated resources um, so that we can have a successful business with it. Um, we do have to choose the right people for the, for the treatment, and then we have to manage the expectations of the patient. You know, what I like to tell our patients is that your glands are dying, and I show them a picture of lithography and explain to them how their glands are not flowing, we bring up the lippy view and we show them how their oil layer is significantly deprived and deficient and how they're not blinking appropriately. And with the, with the education that we give them, we then set some expectations for them and say that if, if we do not proceed with the treatment, that there is a very, very high likelihood that their glands will continue to die and uh, that their symptoms will get significantly worse over time. And these patients are already irritated and uncomfortable with their eyes, and so they really catch on to that. And what we tell them is our primary endpoint with this treatment is to keep your eyes from getting worse. And uh, we do tell them that we hope that they feel better, and the vast majority of them do, as the study showed that 80% of them show a significant improvement in their comfort. But when they understand that our primary endpoint is to keep them from getting worse, they really understand that there is an objective here far beyond just helping them feel better. And the patients really do like that uh, as far as their expectation. Tear Science has done a great job. You know, they're a great company. Um, if you haven't had an opportunity to meet them at a trade show or uh, have one of their um, you know, sales, uh, sales team come out to meet with you, uh, you should give them a call. They're a great group of people, and uh, they, they have some really good tools to help you in the office to support you. Um, their success is highly tied to your success, where a lot of companies, um, they, you know, they, they, they sell you the machine and then they're out, where Tier Science has a vested interest in you being successful with their equipment. So they've got some great marketing tools and some great forms and so forth. And uh, then, you know, clinical training in the office. We shut the office down for an entire day and had them come in and do some clinical training. And, you know, I will, will, will reluctantly say, but comfortably say, I probably learned more in that one day about dry eye than I did in the uh, four years of optometry school and five or six years of practice following it. Uh, and we just learned a whole lot as a practice, and they do a great job of helping us implement the material into our office as well. Overall, in a survey that was sent out to patients who had had the lippy flow treatment, 82% of the patients said that they would recommend lippy flow to their family and friends. And uh, at that, um, at the marking of when the study was done, which was two months following, 15% said, yeah, it's, you know, it's still a little bit early to tell. But um, a, re a recommendation of I would rec recommend this to my family and friends is one of the highest recommendations that anybody can give you because it goes beyond just, yeah, I would do it again, but it goes on to say, I would be so comfortable that this treatment worked for me as to say to my nearest friends and my nearest family that I would go, on, go ahead and recommend it. Bringing about great patient satisfaction with the patient retention and ultimately when we can go from a satisfied patient to an ecstatic patient, we really can increase the patient referrals for, uh, for, for what we can bring into the office. You know, so overall, the, the underlying picture here is um, I'm going to slide through some of the slides about uh, some of the regulatory information, is when our patients uh, are on their computers, when they're on their electronic devices, they just fail to blink as often as they should. 
and uh, you know nearly in the 50 to 75 percent less than they should be blinking. And we found in our office that oftentimes the blinking that they do that they do is is just bad blinking, partial blinking. Uh, the lippy view is very, very clear in picking that up, and then we show that to our patients. In fact, you can slow down a video of the patient over the 19-second period to show how bad they blink, and most of them are very, uh, are uh, you know, are really key into how bad their blinking is. And overall, when they aren't blinking appropriately, those glands ultimately get plugged mostly because the, the muscles of Wyland are not ex, uh, excreting the oil into the tear film, and so the, the glands get plugged. Uh, and then when we use the MGE to try to express those glands, we're not able to get them to flow. That leads us into looking at mybography and realizing that when a gland is plugged, it will eventually die in atrophy. And when we see that and we see our patient's glands are plugged, the loopy view is showing a decreased oil volume and a bad blinking. It just drives us in the direction to make a recommendation to these patients that they need to do lippy flow. And uh, the patients in our office have been very satisfied. Uh, in the six months that we have had the machine, we have only had two patients who have elected to not do it. Uh, because of a, a, a cost differential. The vast majority of the patients um, are very, very keen into doing this procedure, and we've had great success, uh, you know, mirroring the data that I presented here from the studies on the overall improvement in the gland score. The studies indicate a 90% improvement in gland score and gland quality, and 80% of the patients um, have a symptomatic relief, and that is very, very similar to the results that we're getting. And 82% of the patients that are out there uh, at two months would recommend this not just to um, themselves to do again, but to their family and friends. And overall, that is just the highest uh, form of um, a form of acceptance that we can have, and really drives uh, more referrals into our patient base. And uh, so overall, you know, we've had a, a great success with the treatment. It's really opened our eyes to dry eye and, you know, would be happy to answer any questions at this point that, uh, that anybody may have. Um, and then following this webinar, uh, and I'll leave this um, up here as we're doing the questions, you can certainly e email any questions that you have to marketing at tierscience.com. And uh, so we'll go ahead and open it up to questions. Awesome. Woo. Excellent. Well, so thank you, David. That was pre uh, a great presentation. As, as I mentioned to everyone, the pre-recorded is the way to go because that was nice and tight. So thank you for that. And uh, right. I think what we want to do is open up the floor to questions right now. And David, are you still there with us? Yeah, I'm still here. You ready for some questions? <laughs> Sure, yes, let's can, put it on the questions. Being a, being a host, let me start off. <laughs> I, don't, I haven't looked at the list here. Uh, David, uh, when when do my bovine glands start dying off? Are they like brain cells that at a certain age, they will start just naturally dying? Uh, so I can't speak to the research on that question. Um, I, I, I don't know for sure. Uh, I do believe that there is a level of dying off of meibomian glands that will occur in everybody to a small degree. Uh, so I can't speak to that for sure and, and at what age they start dying. However, I do know that if you look up across an age population and Pappas is uh, either in the process or just publishing along with uh, a PhD fellow in Australia showing individuals with normal symptoms what their meibomian glands look like. And across the ages, uh, various different people have uh, really good quality meibomian glands. So I don't believe that it is one of those things where everybody will uh, lose all of their meibomian glands, you know, on the, uh, up until the very day that they die. Um, I alluded to in the presentation that we just did a um, a quick tutorial on on um, dry eye here in the practice with a group of doctors, 
And those doctors were ranging in age from about 40 to about 60. And uh, the overall loss of the meibomian glands in that subgroup just alone, because we looked at you know, that small group of doctors really quickly, the percentage of loss in their glands was very, very, very minimal. And I think that just ties back into the philosophy that people who work on a computer all day, which as optometrists we don't, um, people who work on a computer all day long tend to lose their glands faster. So I think there's a lot of research that needs to come out about that. I don't know the answer to that question for sure. It's probably been studied. Um, so that's the best thing I can kind of make up on the spot. Sure. Um, you know, question here. You mentioned in your talk that uh, you, you don't actually use uh, the lipoflow on everybody. Um, can you give us a, a sense of what who a good candidate might be versus a, a not so good candidate? Yeah. So who's a good candidate for lippy flow? Well, you know, it's not one of those things where you always say if A, B, and C all equal uh, are all there, then uh, you need to do X, Y, Z. Um, it's one of those things where you're really making a clinical decision. So for me, a typical lippy flow patient is going to be somebody who, when I do lippy view on them, their uh, overall lipid value is very low, um, and that means lower than 100. Uh, it's going to be a person who typically has some meibomian gland uh, loss on mybography, and what I put most of my weight on is the uh, value of the oil that is coming out of their glands. So what I do with the MGE. And I'm glad you're giving away an MGE tonight because I think that that tool should be in every single optometric office, whether you have a lippy flow or not, uh, just as a general screener. If you're doing an MGE on a patient and you don't get any oil coming out of the glands, uh, not treating that patient it would be synonymous to having somebody who's losing their uh, losing you know their ability to see with glaucoma and doing nothing about it. So I'll weigh things very very heavily. If I see somebody who has uh, very little glands left on uh, mybography, you know who has lost 50, 60, 70 percent of their glands, and they have you know low flow on my, on lippy view and low flow on MGE that patient is an absolute candidate. But if I see somebody whose who's, uh, meibomian gland scores are, um, are relatively normal, but their symptoms are high, uh, that's a patient who probably doesn't have evaporative dry eye, but may have an aqueous deficiency, which that person would not be a candidate for them. Um, you know, it, what we're trying to do with lippy flow is get the glands to flow again. So a quick answer is, if their glands are not flowing, we do lippy flow. If their glands are flowing, they're not a candidate for lippy flow. Got it. Question here, two-part question, actually. First question is, um, who can actually do the lipoflow flow procedure? Do you need the doc to do it, or can an assistant do it? And the second question is, do you know of any states uh, where you're not actually allowed to use the device? Um, I am not aware of any states that you cannot use the device. I believe that the instrument is in nearly every state at this point. Um, I, so I'm, I'm not certain about that. Um, in my office, I oversee the entire process. My, uh, my technician does insert um, the uh, ap activators into the patient's eyes under my supervision. And... Uh, um, I may or may not be in the room, but I'm always checking in on the patient. So it doesn't uh, slow down my exam process throughout the day as long as I have, you know, a, a spare technician. Um, but we always do the treatment on the day of the dry eye evaluation if the patient is up for it. And probably 70 to 80 percent of the time, the patient will do it on the day of the evaluation. Uh, but we're not pushing people, we're not forcing people, we're not strong-arming people or trying to use some sales gimmicks to get people to do the procedure. We're basically just presenting the science to them and telling them what our doctor recommendation is. And most of them move forward. 
on the day of. So it has the potential to slow somebody down if they really don't schedule themselves appropriately. But in our office, it doesn't slow us down at all because we always have at least one person in the office who uh, can take a you know 15 minute break from whatever they're doing to help the patient out. And our uh, our technicians and our team is very good about getting the getting the um, activators in the patient's eye. There's only been a couple instances where they've needed me to come in to help with the process, but generally it's very simplified and very easy for even a technician to do. Great. Uh, question here, do you know if uh, the procedure is covered by any insurance companies? And if not, um, how much do you typically charge for the procedure? Yeah, so um, I, I can't speak to um, all insurance companies, but uh, from what I know, we can talk about Medicare. There is no Medicare allowable uh, reimbursement, and so that means that most insurance companies are uh, following suit, and there is uh, no coverage. Uh, we have not had any coverage for any of the uh, any any of our patients that have done it. 100% of them have cash paid out of the out, out of the gate, and uh, we uh, and we don't submit it to insurance. Um, I can't. I also cannot speak to what we charge for the procedure. Um, just simply for you know rules and regulations of um, antitrust and so forth. Um, so I, I apologize. I'm not trying to be evasive in that. Uh, typically, people charge um, you know charge a fair amount for the procedure, and uh, you would probably want to speak to a tier science sales uh, sales consultant who could give you a better idea of of what um, people may be charging on average in your region. So, I, I, Adam and, and Paul, I apologize that I'm just not comfortable stating that, and it's regionally different uh, around the country as well. Just as a follow-up to that question, how long does the treatment take? Yeah. How, how many good. visits? Yeah. Uh, so good. Good question there, uh, Paul. Is the um, the procedure itself, where we put the activator into the patient's eye, takes twelve minutes, and uh, so um, a system that we have in our office is that we will see the patient for their comprehensive eye exam. And if we detect something that is out of the ordinary, we will see them back for a dry eye evaluation, uh, much like you would see a patient back who is suspicious for glaucoma for a glaucoma evaluation. We inform the patient on that uh, visit uh, what we will be doing during their dry eye evaluation. And occasionally I will tell them there's a good chance we may need to move forward with lippy flow depending on the outcomes of that finding, uh, of the finding of that visit. Uh, we'll then do the dry eye evaluation, which is where we do all of the assessments, um, including mybography, lippy view, um, MGE expression, and uh, several other tests, which we didn't talk about all tonight. Um, and then if the patient elects to do the lippy flow, we, uh, if they need it and they do it, we'll do that either that day or a following day. And uh, then we'll typically see the patient back um, for an appointment about uh, four to six weeks later and uh, assess to see how they are doing. They may not get the full effect of uh, lippy, lippy flow even at four weeks because there's still some neurotrophic potentially issues that need to be solved. Most of our patients do report a significant improvement in comfort by four weeks, um, and then we'll maybe assess them at three or six months. If I see a patient who is having meibomian gland death or loss with the mybographer, I'm certainly going to be seeing that patient on a six-month um, routine visit, just like we would with our, uh, our glaucoma or our diabetic patients. Sure. So it's a single treatment? Uh, yeah, I'm... Uh, yeah. I'm really answering your questions with long answers, but yeah, it's just one treatment. <laughs> right. uh, then, uh, so just as a final follow-up, uh, do patients have to come back after a year and, and have the same problems and do you then give them a, another treatment? 
Yeah, and uh, and that is you know the major concern, and actually what kept me from getting the device uh, initially is I thought this was going to be the sort of thing that people would need to have every three months. Um, so there is uh, some information that has been published on somebody who is uh, has been doing the procedure for three years, and the percentage of his patients. And I apologize, I don't have that research in front of me but a significant percentage of his patients have not needed to be retreated in three years. But just like anything, you know, we're clumping in that question, Paul, we're clumping the individuals who have 99% gland loss, and you're asking me about the same people who have zero gland loss, but the glands are all plugged. So the answer to the question is, well, that depends. If somebody has, um, you know, 90% of their glands that are dead, for the rest of their life, they have to rely on the 10% of glands that are still there. And many of those patients may return back in six months or a year. And I haven't had this in my practice yet because I've only had the machine for uh, six months. But individuals who have spoken to, a lot of times those patients will report back and say, please do the procedure on me again. Um, I'm you know, starting to feel like my eyes are getting dry again. Um, but it may be that some of those individuals who have 90% of their glands still in existence, um, those glands mis may still be functioning completely you know, normal, and they may not need treatment again. Just imagine that the person who had 90% of their glands still functioning had 10% of their glands plugged or 20% of their glands plugged at one year, they're still going to be functioning very well. Whereas the individual who has only 90% of their gland or 90% of their glands dead, uh, for them, if they lose 20% more of their glands, there's a significant reduction for them. So the short answer is it depends. <laughs> Great question here about cost. Can you give us a ballpark of what the unit costs and the expendables and so forth? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually not really comfortable on that either because, uh, because each, uh, each individual person is probably going to get, um, you know, there may be a show special that they're a part of and so forth. So I think the best person to answer that would be to email the tier science individuals. Um, I don't have any, you know, any say in those sort of things. And so I think it would be best to ask somebody from tier science that question sure question here from somebody who looks like he just actually got his units in today and he wants to know what kind of physical setup in the office that you have to have to set these things up uh, efficiently yeah so you need an outlet uh, to plug the machine in um, and uh, beyond that it's pretty much the standard stuff that we we normally have so we've uh, we actually have purchased a, an IKEA cabinet that we stack the lippy flow on top of that sits right next to one of the examination chairs in other offices they'll utilize a uh you know a a, a, a closet i know of an office who uses one of their spare closets is where people get their lippy flow treatments in we do it in an exam chair and the machine is movable so if we put it on a on an instrument with uh or on a table with with wheels we can move it in between the exam rooms that's the lippy flow for the treatments. We just do it right in the exam chair. The lippy flow, I'm sorry, the lippy view machine is uh, is a machine that we set up on uh, on a table, just like our autorefractor would be, and uh, the patient just bellies up right to it, and then we uh, perform the machine right on them. So we utilize a, a table that goes up and down, just like an autorefractor table for the lippy view. The lippy flow just needs to be in close contact to a chair for the patient to sit in. It doesn't have to be an exam chair. It could be a, uh, you know, a waiting room chair for them to sit in. Right. Question here. Uh, in general, what other tests do you do for a dry eye workup in your office? Yeah, so the dry eye workup in our office typically goes like this. The patient comes into the office and we uh, do a speed questionnaire and a uh, we personally do an OSDI. The speed questionnaire really is the one that we pay more attention to, but we do uh, like to have the information from the OSDI as well. 
We like to have a subjective symptom information from our patients rather than asking them, how do you feel today? So we do the uh, speed questionnaire. The patient then is taken back by one of the technicians and uh, it does the Lippy view instrument. Then they go over to the uh, keratograph, which is what the instrument we currently use for mybography. We do tear breakup time uh, on that machine. We do tear meniscus height on that machine and we do the mybography on that machine. And then we take the patient into the exam room and I come in and we do a fluorescein assessment tear breakup just to see what the difference is between the non-invasive tear breakup and the invasive tear breakup. And then quite possibly the most valuable dye that we can use is lysamine green or rose bengal to look at Mark's line staining as well as lid wiper epitheliopathy. Um, lid wiper epitheliopathy has really become one of my key hallmark pictures for my Bohmian gland dysfunction, as well as Mark's line. Um, and those two things have, have really taught me a lot about dry eye and particularly um, uh, lipid deficient or evaporative dry eye. So we'll do those two assessments and then we'll move on to uh, doing the MGE. Uh, so at that point, we'll dry the surface of the eyelid utilizing a Q-tip or a cotton-tipped applicator, and then we'll use the MGE and assess their overall oil. We'll then, you know, look at all that data and evaluate whether the patient, um, well, with fluorescein, not only are we doing uh, tear breakup, but we're also looking for any staining. Um, and then that's it. That's, uh, that's all the information we need. And then we decide what type of treatment we need to put the patient on, whether it's, um, you know, lippy flow or whether the patient has another type of dry eye. And uh, then we move on from there. Great. Question here, and actually this has been asked now, I think, three or four times on my list, so I guess it's important. <laughs> uh, people are asking, after you do a treatment, do you ever use an antibiotic like doxycycline? Uh, yeah, great question, and the answer is no, never. Um, so uh, a lot of times there's been this thought process that, uh, you know, doxycycline will decrease uh, MMP9s, and I think that's probably realistic, um, but what we feel is that the main reason people's glands are getting plugged is because uh, they're not blinking appropriately. So once they get their glands unplugged with lippy flow, we then teach them how to blink. Our follow-up also is we get them on a, uh, a quality uh, nutraceutical. We use uh, Easy Tears because it has not only good omega-3s, but it also has a, a, a good functional um, eight anti-inflammatory properties which help specific to the tears. And then we also have the patient utilizing a, an artificial tear as needed. Um, that's, our, that's our comprehensive, complete follow-up. Immediately after the procedure, we do put them on, a, uh, on Lodamax for uh, a couple of weeks um, just to kind of let their eyes calm down after the, after the procedure. And each person's follow-up treatment is a little bit different. But the, uh, the function of doxycycline as, as something to treat MGD is, uh, is not extremely well documented. Um, likewise, it's not well documented as to how well um, azazite, which isn't currently on the market anymore. And there's actually a study going on right now looking at the outcomes of individuals who have been on doxycycline versus individuals who um, per have a lippy flow procedure alone and looking at the two outcomes of those two patient base. So no, Great. we don't use doxycycline. Right. Uh, question here, I guess this is more of an observation than a question. Um, this person observes that uh, postmenopausal women seem to have a really difficult time with dry eyes, at least in his practice. Um, do you notice any differences uh, in their meibomian glands? Yeah, so uh, we've probably had an equal amount of men and women that have done lippy flow. Maybe it's a little bit more on the women. I would have to go and do a full assessment. Um, 
With regards to postmenopausal women as a general class, yes, they tend to have um, to appear as having more dry eye. And um, the, the other key component to that is more and more patients uh, that are postmenopausal women uh, reveal and show up having Sjogren's. And uh, that kind of seems like it's a pretty blanket statement, but we've been doing a very close assessment of Sjogren's in our patients. And just recently, we've been assessing, utilizing a new test that's called SHOW. And what it does is it's a, a simple blood test that we can look at um, our patients to find out what percent, you know, how likely are they to really have Sjogren's. It's a new procedure, a new test from a company called NICOX. And we're finding that the percentage of the individuals who come in with significant dry eye that we do the test on is about 50%. I expected that number to be about 10 to 20% of the patients that we did the test on to be positive for Sjogren's, and it's way higher than we thought. And we know that, uh, that women are more likely to get Sjogren's syndrome. So I'm not entirely sure if, and, and the research is out there, but Sjogren's information is not well understood because it's just not been looked at and in a younger population. I'm kind of curious if the patients in your practice as a general subset have a higher incidence of Sjogren's that you and I would have missed in the past without these type of diagnostic procedures. So as far as their meibomian glands, I don't know that I would say that they look any different than somebody who, uh, who uh, than a male or a person who had dry eye with gland loss that was plugged that was younger. Speaking of women, uh, brings up the question of eye makeup and eyeliner. There seems to be more, uh, if the New York Times has anything to say about it, more radical use of eye makeup uh, this year than in the years past. Uh, does eye makeup and eyeliner have an effect on the meibomian gland? Well, I can speak to that clinically and anecdotally, and I will say absolutely. Um, particularly, and I, I hate to be the one to tell my patients how to use their makeup, but it is quite surprising when we look under the slit lamp and we see uh, women uh, or men who put eyeliner uh, beyond their eyelashes, right over the top of their meibomian glands, uh, you can bet that eventually that's going to cause the meibomian glands to get plugged. So utilizing them beyond the eyelash line in over the meibomian glands is a big no-no, and we educate our patients on that. I don't believe that putting it on the anterior side of the eyelashes is going to cause any major long-term issues. It, you know, it, if it gets into the eye, yeah, it's an issue. Right. So we're, we're just about running out of time. But before, before we go, I just have two things to say. The first thing is, if you want to contact Tier Science at the conclusion of this webinar, your web page is automatically going to flip onto a, a contact form on ODWire, uh, where you can just type in your email address, and the folks at Tier Science can send you more information, uh, you know, about pricing uh, and so forth that we couldn't cover here. And the other thing is the drawing. And the other thing is the drawing. Getting feedback here. Getting feedback uh, is here. the drawing. Uh, is the drawing. Oops. And there we go. And is the drawing. Uh, and for is the drawing. Oops. I'm going to mute David here. There we go. So David was feeding back on me. The drawing for the uh, the uh, meibomian gland evaluator uh, 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 is going to be, I guess, we have so many people here tonight that I don't think I can actually draw it right now. <laughs> okay, in well, a fair way. I usually use a random number generator, so I'm not sure that I can do it. So what I'll do is I'll actually do the drawing um, tonight, and then I'll email, I'll send an email out to everyone who's at the show. And make an announcement want. online. Oh, but of course. We'll and make and an there'll be discussions water. continuing right. on the topic. Yep. And so before we, we log off, David, did you just want to unmute yourself, and do you have any sort of final parting thoughts for us? Um, yeah. So... Um, Everybody for coming on the webinar it helpful and whether you buying a uh, tier science system uh, you know the lippy view or lippy flow um, you know in 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 all regards 
it's uh, it's a fantastic opportunity for your practice for several reasons. Number one is it makes you stand apart. It will help change your patients' lives, and it is really, really profitable for your practice. So those three reasons alone should be reasons why you should seriously consider it. Uh, beyond that, even if you don't buy the system, I would encourage you to look into getting an MGE. And, you know, Tier Science is not in the business of selling MGEs, but I think enough of us have worked on them to try to convince them that it's a great tool for the primary care practitioner who doesn't have a system to have and get that instrument. And if you are doing an assessment on a patient who you cannot get any of their glands to flow or they've got 75 or 50 percent of their glands that are plugged, uh, you should seriously consider referring that patient on to one of your colleagues who can do the procedure for them. You know, synonymous to the early days of an OCT and the early days of treating glaucoma is before we had therapeutics, we would never leave a patient with uh, CD ratios of five, six, or seven untreated. We would be very aggressive at helping those people. And I think that, uh, that dry eye is the anterior segment glaucoma of the future, that we need to be looking very, very closely at it. And, you know, Tear Science is the first to market with producing a product that, that really is not only helping the patient's symptoms, but is really helping the root cause of their dry eye. So that's why it's been helpful for us, and I think it's really the, uh, the, the treatment for the future of our dry eye patients, and I would encourage you to seriously consider it for yourself or know somebody in your area that has the instrument that could, uh, could treat your patients. And Adam and, and Paul, thank you so much for having me on, and uh, hopefully this has been beneficial for your audience and uh, the uh, you know that is going to watch it later, and for the whole group that that watched it uh, this evening. Great. Well, David, thanks so much for being here, and thanks everyone for turning out tonight. And uh, in about ten seconds, you're going to be flipped over to the information page uh, for Tier Science. So good night, everyone. Good night.